Hello, everybody. Welcome to the stream. It's Tech Friday. I'm DC, your host today. And with me today is a very special guest, streamer, owner of Tiny Hat Labs, Puzzle, and all-around great person, Stephen Joyce. Stephen, say hello to the peoples. Hi, I just suddenly realized I was not wearing one of my tiny hats oh. so we have, we have we fixed the problem oh wait now i have to adjust your window for the tiny hat no it's fine you don't have to it's fine nope. i can just i, I can't can, can, no no leave, leave the hat oh okay there perfect <laughs> See, there you go this yeah. is the beautiful the beauty of tiny hat technology i can just adjust it as we need on the fly problem solved tiny hat showing in child Perfectly excellent in there we go Boom. love it love it oh problem fixed yes hello 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 hi so uh tell uh, people about yourself where they can find you <laughs> it's like I'm the tiny hat person. That's me. Uh, yes, I'm Stephen Joyce, a variety streamer on on this platform. Um, I'm Stephen Joyce pretty much everywhere. Uh, so stream on Twitch, YouTube Shorts on YouTube. Um, Stephen Joyce on Twitter. And uh, yeah, this is my my second time now on the show. Yeah, so that's kind of cool. You're my uh, first return guest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I get the mug. Um, I pay way too much attention to the tech side of streaming. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I compensate by by diving into the tech more, so I don't have to think too much about any other aspects of streaming. That's what I do. <laughs> exactly. All um, right. That's true. true. So, you ready to get into this? I am indeed. Absolutely. All right. Today's topic, we're going to talk about something you use every day, but because of the way the patent works and everything, you don't have to think about, which is Codex. Yay! <laughs> it's like a cheer, cheering effect. Yeah! Yay! Yay. Yeah. Woo! Codex! Let's go! So, you're seeing us now. It's a codec. You look at any video online ever, codex involved. And a codec is a thing that encodes and decodes. Codec is kind of a word your video and that's only one thing of the whole video processing thing because first you have a codex moment <laughs> 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 exactly <laughs> <sighs> so I, I was uh telling Stephen this uh, uh before we went live is that you have this idea of containers, which is, say, your .mp4 at the end of a file, right? And we'll say that's your Werther's bag. Inside the Werther's bag, you have individually wrapped candies. The, the candy, that the wrapper there would be H.264. You unwrap it, you get your delicious, delicious video or candy in this instance. So you have container... And your container holds, that was a flimsy joke. <laughs> uh, your container holds the, the video, the subtitles, audio, all that. And your encoder decoder encodes, decodes the video. And it all works together to give you what you see in front of you. And... Also related to that, though, it does it. It's neat, but there's patents around it. In fact, the most common one you use, H.264, has a patent. It is only free to use if you're doing internet video. Any other purpose, you have to pay a group called MPEG LA. And YouTube's there, so you don't think about it, but if you start using it for other purposes than internet video, you have to pay a licensing fee and they will come after you because they are patent people. They mm -hmm. really sprung up around DVDs and MPEG-2. And if you were a small business that made DVDs for archiving purposes, you had to make sure that the equipment you bought so, or the software you licensed had a provision in there that part of their cost was paying the MPEG-2 licensing fee, or they can come after you, and you would have to pay that licensing fee. 
and it was an exorbitantly high fee at scale. It was, it was a lot of money. Yes. So we're looking to get away with that with our topic today, AV1 encoding or the AV1 codec, which yes. will be royalty free as we currently understand it. And it took a lot of big corporations. We're talking Microsoft, Google, Apple, like five others I can't think of right now to get this to work because they had to go through all the patents, make sure that they had access to the proper patents, which took a lot of lawyers, a lot of money, a lot of legal stuff that we're not qualified to get into, and then put it out there for free to use, and then they don't have to pay patent royalties on things either. So for a dive into AV1 and why it is the future of streaming. Let's go over to Steven. Hey. Yay. <laughs> Steven, coming to you live, probably via V9. Uh, v9. <laughs> uh, yeah, on that patent thing, at one point, if I remember correctly, and this will be like from an Epos Fox video five years ago, at one point, I think there were 1,200 different patents associated with MPEG-2. Mm -hmm. so, some, some ridiculous number, which when you think about it, is a lot to juggle. They tried to reduce it and reduce it and reduce it, but the fees never went down. So people were still paying, you know, several dollars per disk nonsense kind of thing going on. Um, but yes, as you can imagine, for a big company like YouTube, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, being tied to patents for stuff was a problem. Um, so YouTube use a thing called VP9 and AV1 is essentially VP9, the new version, um, which is, you know, designed to work like VP9 to be essentially open source, royalty free, um, work as well as H.264 and, you know, H.265, um, for video sizes above 1080p in particular, 4K, 8K, that kind of idea, um, without the mess of licensing costs or just wrangling all of the various parties involved, because that was a big problem with, with MPEG, uh, LA, who have merged with another licensing agreement people, so they're even more patent trolley condensed than ever before. Um, instead of that, just make everybody's lives easier release a standard that people just can use, is available, everybody supports, and just run with it and make everybody's life easier. Um, and it actually came about because at the time, because X, X264, X264, H.264 was so bad and there was so much trouble with H.264, various different individual groups like Mozilla, Cisco, and Google, I think were the three big ones, were all developing their own video codecs. Like, independently nearly of each other. They were all developing their own video codecs, trying to get, they were hiring patent lawyers instead of engineers, <laughs> trying to figure out how the hell they were gonna get through this mess. Um, and they were like, why don't we just all make the same one? And then we could all use it. And then like, we could forget this, we could stop spending so much money on lawyers, how about that? <laughs> so they did. And the idea for AV1 was born. Um, and essentially the big benefit for AV1 for from a company's point of view, is that you can get the same quality in terms of video for a smaller amount of data. So for a smaller bit rate, you can stream better quality video. From YouTube's point of view, for example, um, they will be able to provide the exact same YouTube video you currently watch that's currently in VP9. They'll be able to give that to you exactly the same. You as an end user won't notice the difference for like 40% less bandwidth, which is when you think about it, huge. There's, there's, I think in 2020, there were like nearly a thousand hours of YouTube video being uploaded to YouTube every hour. So the cost of delivering that video worldwide, I don't know what the number is post kind of the, the last three years of lots more people going on the internet to make videos. Um, but if you think about it, there's more hours of video being uploaded every hour than there are hours of the day. It's an exponentially increasing problem. From a company point of view, that's a lot of data. That's a lot of cost. So they have a big investment in finding a way to deliver the same stuff for less. 
um, the people behind every one, the Alliance for Open Media, um, involve like Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Netflix, you know, Mozilla, Cisco, a bunch of other folks. And the idea is that they want to cut down on their data costs. Basically, they want to cut down on their data costs. Oh, also, they don't want to pay lots of licensing fees, that too. Um, so they have developed a codec which is way more efficient than what we are all currently using. It blows VP9 out of the water. It blows H.264 out of the water. Um, it is just way, way better at doing its job, particularly at higher resolutions, um, which will mean for most folks who will never notice the difference, it'll be cheaper for Netflix to give you video. You'll be able to download 4K video with a slower internet connection than before. Video calls will be a huge one because that's a big, big part of it. Um, getting a decent quality video chat for like a fraction of the bandwidth. Um, but because you need hardware to do the encoding part, the decoding part is, has been more common um, over the last few years. Like anyone who bought a smartphone in the last couple of years, it can already do AV1 uh, decoding. Um, any you know, newer televisions, all of the graphics cards that have come out in the current generation. So for NVIDIA, that's 40 series cards. For AMD, that's 7,000 series cards. And any Intel ARC card, they can all do both encode and decode, which is fantastic. But over the next couple of years, it'll become the new standard. Uh, but there is a hardware requirement to encoding, um, particularly um, making it fast enough for live streaming was tricky because encoding is an intensive task. So converting my face talking to you into 60 images every second and doing it well, very fast, uh, requires dedicated hardware. But that's okay. We'll, in the next couple of years, most of those will appear, start appearing all over the place. All the new consoles will have AV1. Um, and you will, as end, an end user, you'll never notice. Like just one of these days, you'll start getting videos in AV1 instead of VP9, and you will never know. <laughs> you will probably never know or care. <laughs> right. Um, from a streamer point of view, uh, we will change some settings in OBS and then happily get on with our lives, and this will be great too. Um, yeah. And but uh, yeah, it's the, what oh, tech. The, Sorry, uh, no, the uh, you're talking about the encoding, and that mm. that is one of the big things with. Uh, when they started AV1 was that the encoding took way longer. And so mm -hmm. what the new hardware does is cuts down that encoding time quite a bit to make yeah. it more practical. So yeah. this current gen of hardware, the generation after that, we're going to see a lot more, uh, a lot faster encoding rates and it will be yeah. where it, where we think it kind of should be and not a big bother. Yeah, I mean, I think that was that was I say that was one of the big things was the was the live streaming part because yeah, you could you could theoretically encode anything slowly, <laughs> of course, <laughs> right? Um, but you can't do it fast enough to stream with without introducing massive latency, which will then in turn into frames getting dropped and other sort of shenanigans. Um, I mean, when you think about how um, we I, we don't want to probably go into too much about how encoders work, um, but when you think about like H.264 is a classic example. Um, taking a still frame, breaking it up into a grid, and then trying to approximate some of the information to cut down on the data requirement. Instead of each individual frame telling you on your end what every single pixel is. Think about how many millions of pixels there are in an image. We'll look at some of them and we'll guess the in-between bits. Cool. Okay, that makes sense. And that way we'll shorten it. It's the same for anytime someone uses a JPEG. It's not a raw, it's not a raw image file. It's an approximation that's a much, much smaller file size. Same idea for, for encoding. But if you think about as resolutions get higher and frame rates get higher, this is the big thing where H264 starts to fall over in particular. Um, H264 works in breaking up the image into blocks that are 16 by 16 pixels at its maximum size. That means every 16 by 16 pixels in say a 4K image that you're streaming at 60 frames a second, it's doing an analysis of the image, working out what the colors are, trying to see if any of the colors are moving, it's doing motion vectors, it's trying to calculate 
what the next image will look like so that it can cut down on how much data is required because sending you 60 raw images every second would be huge. Um, so it does a lot of guesswork and a lot of fancy maths to, uh, to try and get you an image that to your human eye looks exactly the same, but uses less colors, less information and gets to you easier. Scale the image up to 4K and it's doing it in 16 by 16 blocks and it's trying to do this however many, I, I should have actually, I should have done my research and worked out how many by 16 by 16 blocks there are in a 4K image <laughs> and how many of those are traveling every second. But it can only do so much. As your bit rate drops, it has less and less space to put that image into. Like if you're doing, for example, I stream 1080p 60 frames a second at 6,000 uh, kilobits per second, so six megabit upload, which is less than one megabyte because there's eight bits in a byte. Um, so I, I have less than one megabyte every second to tell you what's going on on my game screen 60 times. That's a lot. So if the game is relatively static and not a lot of stuff is moving, it looks okay. If it's a high speed shooter where I'm turning the camera a lot, you'll see all those blockies that you all know. The blockies are where the encoder isn't able to keep up with the changes for the given amount of file size you're giving it. It's just not fast enough. It just doesn't have the space. It doesn't have the bandwidth. It doesn't have the data. Um, so you get bigger and bigger approximations and those approximations start to look like blockies. Um, AV1 is essentially, well, as I said earlier, it's VP9 dialed up to 11. AV1 is essentially the same kind of idea. It breaks an image up into pieces. It performs noise um, analysis. It performs calculations on motion and all these sort of things. It tries to approximate colors down to a smaller color space. Human eye isn't telling the difference between those 27 shades of green. Make it one shade of green. That means you don't have to send 26 other points of data. Make it all the same shade of green, it'll be fine. If you've ever seen like a really old GIF where it's like 12 colors, think that, but less bad looking. Um, but the great thing about AV1 is because it does it for much larger block sizes and it can slice them up into much more complicated patterns, uh, huge parts of a screen in a 4K movie might all be the same four colors. So it can just go, that's one block and it's all these four colors. Stick a noise pattern over it, no one will notice the difference. So suddenly a quarter of a screen in a 4K film is the same piece of data. That's a huge saving when it comes to delivering that content. Um, it just, it works, it just works better <laughs> at doing what it does. Because I mean, let's be fair to H.264. Think about how old DVDs are. That's how old H.264 is, kind of, you know, it wasn't designed for 4K. It wasn't designed for 8K. It wasn't designed for 120 Hertz. It wasn't designed for internet streaming. <laughs> like it wasn't made for any of this. Um, to be fair to them, H.265 is very good. I don't wanna, I don't wanna poo poo H.265 and H.266. H.265 is very good. H.266 is better than AV1. But the same patent licensing, too many chefs involved mess covers H.266. Um, H.265 is not a good option because there's been no adoption because of the same patent licensing, too many people involved mess. Why didn't we see widespread adoption of um, Ultra HD Blu-rays? Aside from the HD DVD Blu-ray wars and then mm -hmm. the Ultra HD DVD, why don't we see 4K physical discs on everybody's shelves? Because viewer patterns changed. Netflix was a better way for most audience members to consume ultra HD content. Also, licensees didn't have to pay for every single disc <laughs> that went out, every single one. It's like what Sony used to do with CDs. Every single one, there was a licensing cost essentially attached to providing those discs. Um, if I remember rightly, Sony actually did technically, theoretically make money on every single CD ever made. <laughs> Some weird thing. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but yeah, H.266 is great technologically, but is not a workable standard for basically anybody who does anything. Um, hence, AV1 comes along, which is why people like me are so excited about it, is because it's really good, 
and it'll be completely free and it'll just turn up in your OBS one day. It's great. Yeah. And that you day, won't even like... see the name <laughs> AV1 necessarily because it will still output to MP4. MP4 can still be your container for an mm -hmm. a Again, AV1 is just the wrapper and MP4 is your container that it goes into. And so instead of H.264 into an MP4, you have AV1 into an MP4. And you may not even notice that difference because the file will still say .mp4. And if you're, as, as a viewer, if you're watching, if someone like me who's a streamer, um, if I change nothing else other than I start streaming in AV1, you will notice my streams look better. That's, that's probably, if you, if you even notice, because most folks, audio is what they notice, not video. But most folks, you will at least notice my stream looks better. Nothing else will change. You'll just notice it looks better. Finally, we can all play Vampire Survivors. Finally, all of us can play <laughs> Vampire Survivors. <laughs> that's, that's why we really need AV1. Because Vampire Survivors and our bitmates. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Vampire Survivors would still tank even AV1. <laughs> it, it will find a way. <laughs> well, I mean, what's the maximum bitrate we're theoretically allowed upload to twitch at six and a half thousand yeah yeah oh. and our survivors will kill that <laughs> <laughs> oh it's true though it will um but yeah from from a user from an end user point of view over the next couple of years if you buy any new tech um and i would say you, if you won't even notice like youtube right now for example youtube accept live streams in av1 already and they already have on the back end of stuff, as does Netflix, AV1 encoding going on because they can save a lot of file space on their servers. So they're already doing it. Delivering it to you, you need to be able to do the deck part of codec. We'll do the co, you need to do the deck. And unless you have a, a, a decoding side, you're going to get it in VP9 as normal. That's totally cool. Once everything gradually switches over, though, you'll get better video calls to your friends. You'll get better live streams, higher quality of stuff for less bit rate. It's basically a win, win, win because the companies are going to save a lot of money. And as a result, we're all going to get cool new stuff that works really well. And it sets a strong precedent going forward because AV1 is, yeah, 16K video. Um, you'll probably need to scale up again, um, make the block sizes larger, et cetera, et cetera. But like, we're good for years, probably, with AV1. Um, but they'll already be working together again for AV1.2 or AV2 or whatever. Um, the You have now established that this is just a thing we do for free. <laughs> like, it saves everybody money. It makes everyone's life easier. It's a little like how USB, um, USB, for a brief period, USB was a universal standard for a brief period before we started having data, but no data power but no data, power and data, 3.2, 3.3B, 3.2BAF, 3.3. Um, for a while there, everyone could recognize that an Apple, uh, an Apple charging cable was a bit of a con because everyone else was using the same stick. This is the audio codec, video codec equivalent of that. Everyone just uses AV1 and gets on with their lives. Right. And so we do have a question. Uh, does this include audio or is that a separate codec? This does include audio. This is the, audio. Yes. the whole package of things. Uh, yep. Mainly we are, the main talking points about it, they'll kind of skips over audio, uh, but because the video part is what's important, but uh, everything in that includes audio. Uh, so the MP4 part, kind of goes, okay, I got your audio, I got your subtitles, you give me the video, and we'll have a happy time together. Yeah, I mean, What's audio, for really high quality like audio, the bitrate is relatively small anyway, which is great. Um, like, we, we can do, you can do lossless audio for a relatively small connection. It's video that's super intensive. So, but it just does include audio. Yeah, the whole the whole thing will just be it'll just be AV1 instead of VP9. Mm -hmm. Happy days. And uh, it uh, let's see here. Well, let's slowly break into. I think we're at a point where we can talk about OBS Studio 
and their implementation I, I of AV1. About AV1. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. If we haven't I'm not talked sure how enough much about information AV1. they provided, other than Stephen's really happy about it. So if that's enough for you, you should be happy about it too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but uh, as Stephen has said, AV1 is the future of streaming. I completely agree. It's where, where we should be going. Uh, and yeah, so start looking for that. It's now in your settings in OBS. You don't want to go to it now with your current stuff. But once mm -hmm. you get a new rig in another year or two, you definitely want to take advantage of that AV1 uh, hardware. Yeah. Basically, any new graphics card you buy from any generation that's come out as of like last Christmas. So 40 series NVIDIA, 7,000 series AMD, Intel, ARC, any of those, they're all AV1 encoders as well as decoders. And the newer consoles will also all have it. Um, so your current rig, unless you just bought a brand new graphics card real recently for a lot of monies, um, your current rig won't do AV1 yet, but any future upgrade, it'll just be included as standard on pretty much all of them. So. And uh, so let's talk a bit about OBS now that, uh, oh, sorry, what do you do with older graphics cards? Uh, if you got to, yeah, <laughs> if you can put them in an older system that maybe someone else needs, great. Or uh, I have a recycling center near me that takes computer parts and I, I'll just give it to them. There is also, there is also a, probably not for most people thing you know some people still do um two piece two pc streaming which is very very common uh, was back in the day particularly um if you're not a two pc streamer i'm like i'm not um one cool thing though is that the intel arc graphics cards are really cheap relatively speaking i know graphics cards are already expensive but relatively cheap um it is entirely possible for you to keep your if you've got a nice big beefy say you've got a 3080 or a 2080 or something nice big beefy card and you don't want to get rid of that yet you could pick up a tiny cute adorable bottom tier intel arc graphics card <laughs> and plug it into your motherboard in the next pcie by eight slot that you've got down the bottom of your board um, like where most of us would keep a capture card if you have an internal capture card. You could plug in an Intel Arc graphics card and literally just use it to encode your stream. Rather than, because big graphics cards, if you, if you bought a 2080, you spent a lot of money on that. You want to get your miles worth out of that. You could pick up an Intel Arc card, particularly when the new ones come out. When Because right now, they're, they're first generation there. But once Battle Mage comes out, their first generation is going to become much, much cheaper. Um, so you could pick up one for, you know, probably less than a couple of hundred dollars, whack it in your system and just use it to encode your video, which means your current GPU could do all your gaming and not have to worry about encoding your stream. Um, so there are, there are kind of, there are definitely options available depending on how much money you spent on your current graphics card. <laughs> I, I feel sorry for someone who was like, I just bought a 3080 and now you do this to me. <laughs> But yeah, I'm serious. You know where I am. So, you know, just drop me a message. <laughs> okay. So uh, we'll get into OBS 29.1 because we have, as we said, AV1 codex included now. Again, not going to be much use to you, but just know that it's there and ready and waiting. It's waiting. Mm -hmm. It has a plan. When you uh, see RTMP plus, just nod respectfully and come back to it later. <laughs> <laughs> so what else do we have in OBS 29.1 that we're looking forward to? That is really great. Fragmented MP4 and Rav. Sorry, I, so you're, you're the host and I'm here over here. Like, <laughs> what do we have? It's not a call and response thing, Stephen. What do we have? Fragmented <laughs> files. Thanks, God. <laughs> Oh, I'm so ex I'm so excited for those. I'm it's it's a sad thing to be excited about, but I'm very excited. <laughs> so, if you didn't know, uh, you normally in OBS because of the way file formats work, traditionally you'd have to use MKV if something went wrong on your video or just you needed to pause the stream. In MKV, you could pause, unpause, and it would start going again. MP4, you would lose the whole thing if you had to stop. But now there's this idea of fragmented MP4s where you can pause the video if you need to, reset whatever you need to reset, 
go again, unpause, and it'll keep its flow as one single video, and you won't, you know, you'll just see the scene jump, and it's much easier to cut out later, and you don't have to transcode anything from MKV to MP4. It's all just uh, MP4 right away. I like as well to use the analogy from earlier, which I think should be the new de facto standard for discussing uh, wrappers and containers. If you use the word as original model to describe <laughs> this, your current MP4 file is a word as original bag with a word as original suite in it that is the size of the entire bag and a teeny tiny word original at the top that says, this is the subtitles and this is where everything is and these are the timestamps and this is the codec. If you lose your bag of words original, you lose the whole thing. Fragmented word as originals, you see now, this is the perfect <laughs> analogy. You've got a bag of words originals and inside that bag is hundreds of little individually wrapped bags of Werther's Originals, <laughs> all with their own Werther's Originals inside them. <laughs> I think for fragmented MP4, I think it's I think it's all based off the same um, Matroska MKV stuff. I think it's every 10 seconds. So every 10 seconds, your fragmented MP4 is basically topping and tailing a video MDAT file with a metadata file every 10 seconds. So if your stream crashes, you might lose the last nine and a bit seconds, as opposed to the whole darn thing. Um, so yeah, it, it, instead of a box with two things in it, and you lose the whole lot if you lose any of it, it's a box with hundreds of little boxes with video files in them. It's, it's wonderful because MKV is great and all, and I'm very thankful to it for its service over the years, but there are audio <laughs> sync issues with, M with MKV. You have to remux everything. I I literally cleared 50 gigs of MKV files off my hard drive in the last two days because they're files that I auto remuxed. So I have all these files in MP4 and all of the originals in MKV and they're all sitting there taking up space. No mm -hmm. more of that. Straight into MP4 or .mov, which comes with additional benefits depending on your use case. This is great for recording. It's not got anything to do with streaming, really. It's 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 recording side stuff. But if you're someone who uses, to hearken back to my original performance on this show, if, you have, if you're someone who uses the um, Atom vertical um, uh, plugin, plugin for OBS to produce TikToks or YouTube shorts, no more recording to MP4 and then Remux, or no recording to MKV and then Remuxing, straight into fragmented MP4. System crashes, OBS crashes, not that OBS ever crashes. OBS crashes, anything goes wrong, you've got most of it still saved. You'll be fine. It's great. Long overdue. Um, I'm, oh, <laughs> I'm so excited for this update. And it is just in settings. Now, uh, there's a possibility that your system may say if you activate this MP4 uh, fragment that uh, OBS will say, encoding overload so uh you may have to play with some settings or it just may not work with your current graphics card so just be aware that it's amazing but test it out hi sure. and no doubt the usual the usual places on youtube the usual like epos fox being my my, my usual go-to for some of this stuff mm -hmm. they'll undoubtedly put out a video Addy will undoubtedly put out a video explaining why you're getting that encoder overload a message. So, you know, <laughs> feel free to give it a few days and then check back in <laughs> because yeah, it, it, it might not work with your current settings. You might have to tweak some stuff, particularly if you're encoding on a graphics card, you have a couple of settings to change maybe. So, you know, but it's there. And if you are someone who uses OBS for recording, like I do, um, as well as streaming, it's going to be a game changer. It's so good to have. Um, yeah, no more, no more, no more crashes killing your recording. All right. Is there anything else that stands out to you about this uh, new OBS update? I'm just kind of looking at the file over on another monitor. Uh, yeah. Two things All off right. the back of fragmented MP4s and fragmented .movs, um, lossless audio codec um for uh was it pcm 32 bit float um so if you're using if you're using fragmented mp4 i think it's 24 bit but if you're using uh dot mov fragmented mobs 
uh, you have support for, I think it's PCM 32 bit float. And what that basically mm -hmm. means is that you're from a, from a, from a, from a streamer user point of view, uh, no more clipping issues. If you absolutely, if you've got a 32 bit interface or you're, you've blown your audio out with software filters, um, and you've clipped your audio really badly, like you've maxed it out and it sounds awful. Your 32 bit, um, recording, you'll be able to just bring the volume down and there's your audio, uh, not, not completely destroyed by maxing out your mic. I'm not a shouty streamer. It is not a problem I have. <laughs> However, <laughs> there will be some shouty streamers out there who will be like, oh, I totally garbled that one piece of my clip because my audio peaked right out the top. And you're like, yes, open it up in your audio program of choice and dial that bad boy down. There you go. <laughs> problem solved. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not that kind of audio guy though. So, um, take that as a very, very casual layman's appreciation of 32 bit, um, audio. Um, but it's, again, it's just a very nice feature to have. I'm way more excited about the uh, fragmented, fragmented files in AV1. Um, although Twitch, I will point out maybe one thing, Twitch has not got their act together yet. We all know Twitch is great for getting their act together in a timely fashion. Um, YouTube is already doing it and saving a lot of money already. Um, so we're hoping Twitch will save money soon, um, by switching over to AV1 stuff. Um, because like Twitch, I remember at one point they put out a, it was during the whole, um, revenue split conversation. They said something like to deliver video to a hundred CCV streamer who streams 200 hours a month, which is kind of like there, we use this as kind of a test case costs more than a thousand dollars a month. So basically on a streamer like me, Twitch actually loses money. I stream more hours and my CCV is slightly lower. So Twitch spend more money delivering my video than they make off me in terms of subs. I assume they make it up on plenty of other streamers, but they don't have to spend that money on that bandwidth. They could switch to AV1 and save a bunch of money and no one else would notice or care. So the sooner Twitch get their act together and get AV1 stuff rolling, um, the better for Twitch, they will save money, which you know, for those of us who live on this platform, we would like them to save money and not be in financial distress. Anyway. Sorry, sorry, oh, no, tangent. that's fine. <laughs> <Side tangent. laughs> um, I realize I had not said Twitch is not doing this yet. <laughs> <laughs> so we did the uh, audio flow. Was there another thing that the stinger transition thing is cool? Oh, yes, the stinger um, transition mm -hmm. thing. Okay. Yeah, let's get into that. Hmm. You go right, whichever you prefer. Oh, go, go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah, Stinger Transitions, for those of you who are streamers, the thing that you play as you move from one screen to another usually uh, has some form of transparency in the image. Um, like I have a bunch of transitions that I use on my stream where, you know, something wipes across the screen or slides across the screen, and you use that to hide the switcheroo that you're doing behind the scenes. Uh, there is no uh, software, well, no, there's no, there's no GPU accelerated, I should say, way of um, decoding a Stinger transition that has a transparency alpha layer. It has to be done on your CPU. It is basically always done as a software encoding. Um, so that leads to particularly at larger sizes. If you're someone who streams in 1440 or 4k with alpha transparencies, you've seen this, there's usually a slight stutter or sometimes it doesn't play exactly when you want it to, or sometimes it plays like a fraction late or clips at the end. Stinger transitions at larger resolutions have always been just slightly wonky, just a little bit but it's a noticeable thing. You will usually, usually lose a couple of frames doing a stinger transition. Nobody notices really. It's just, they're never quite very smooth because it has to be done on your CPU, the same CPU that is running windows and Google Chrome and stream deck software, Elgato wave software, your game, part of your game, all of the stuff that your GPU isn't doing. Um, the solution, that they have come up with is buffering your stinger transitions into RAM, which is great because it basically means your stinger transition comes in your OBS 
pre-encoded. All you got to do in OBS is select your Stinger transition and tick a box now in the new update that says buffer this to RAM. And it will sit there in RAM, ready and waiting, fully decoded for you for when you switch scenes. And as a result, it'll just run smooth because it's all the calculations and maths have already been done. It's already ready to go permanently, as opposed to every time you change scene, it's got to load it up, pull in the file, work out the transparencies. It's going to be much, much, much smoother. Not a big, big, big deal unless you use very high resolution stinger transitions, but it's a nice feature to have either way. Going forward, particularly as most of us are going to probably eventually start moving away from 1080p. I reckon AV1, AV1 adoption could be the, the thing that pushes us past 1080p. Because a lot of people are, they're, they're, they're using 1440p monitors or 4K monitors. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of users out there because you, you can't buy a 1080p television anymore. So you've got a lot of people who are watching on 4K screens and they're watching 720p streams or 1080p streams on a 4K telly. Um, I reckon AV1 will allow a lot of us to encode for the same bit rate a higher resolution image. Um, and we might sort of see this things like Stinger transitions at 4K with transparency becoming more of a thing. Also, a lot of people who do um, streamers outside the kind of the circles that I work in who have kind of like really big, like full time professional streamers, um, a lot of them record their videos in 4K even if they stream in 1080p. So their entire OBS is 4K because they record 4K for YouTube. And then they stream 1080p because bitrate allowance. They would like to stream 4K if they could. Um, so for them, for folks like that, this is going to be a great change as well. And for everybody watching, I mean, slightly less, you know, laggy scene transitions. Yay. Yay. <laughs> it's very exciting if you're a streamer with a very, very large <laughs> resolution, I'm sure. <laughs> but yeah, it's nice. I mean, say it's, it's not as cool as fragmented MP4 files. I, I would get fragmented MP4 files on a t-shirt. That's how cool that is. <laughs> Hashtag fragmented MP4s. I, I want to get I want to get I want to get a mug that says something instead of saying painting pirate. Um, I want to get a mug that says something like you know my other stream is fragmented or something like that, <laughs> or my other stream is an AV1. You know something like that. <laughs> oh, how sad is that? <laughs> wow. <laughs> hey, there are some very happy people over at the Alliance of Open Media who are like, see that guy? That guy loves what we did. It took us <laughs> ages to work that out. We had to do all sorts of horrible maths and no one's going to appreciate it. <laughs> Excellent. So on that mm. note, we're going to take a break. <laughs> oh, every time you have me on, I just derail the whole thing. <laughs> this is why I have you on. <laughs> You just get to sit back and just you just turn the key and let Steve go. <laughs> All right. Oh dear, uh, oh dear. We'll be back in around five minutes or so. So enjoy the break. Get up, stretch, get waters, water yourself, uh, whatever you want to do. I I won't be looking, so you know, do what you need. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we'll see you all in about five minutes. See you soon. Hello, everybody. Welcome once again to the stream. Let me. Pause pretzel there. Yeah, there we go. Right so Hooray. if you have questions about anything we talked about, please let us know. And uh, now we're going to kind of break into some other topics that we've come up with. And the first thing we want to do kind of related to what we're talking about is a, uh, what would you call it, a convention, a show? Uh, yeah, Computex. Um primarily uh, uh, related to the conversation about um, about uh, AV1 encoders and the hardware required to do it. Um, Computex is on at the end of the month. Um, for, for those of you who have lives, <laughs> you probably didn't know this, but everybody <laughs> like me uh, is like, yeah, Computex is happening at the end of the month. Um, so in terms of affordable, again, in the world of technology at the moment, affordable is a Semi useless term, but um, in the in the frame of affordable uh, graphics cards, um, Computex should see the release of more affordable options in terms of both uh, Team Green and Team Red. Um, both Nvidia and AMD have new cards that are going to be announced. Um, they've already the SKUs have already been added to like 
retailer online databases and stuff. So they're 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 real. They're happening, and Computex is when they usually happen. Um, so we will see um, mid or lower mid tier uh, offerings from both Nvidia and AMD. I don't know what Intel are planning. I suspect they'll do something, but there's not as much talk out of Intel lately. Um, but that will mean that if you are someone who is probably going to upgrade, like, you know, maybe Christmas or, you know, after that kind of thing, there will be plenty of AV1 encoding cards around um, that you'll be able to get your hands on. I mean, there currently are lots of them on store shelves all over the place because they're not selling at their current price. Um, 4070s, for example, basically being available in all the varieties everywhere because it's overpriced by about $100. Um, so you can encode right now, but if you wait until the end of Computex and they announce the new cards, we'll almost certainly get a 4060 Ti, which is AV1 encoding. Um, we'll get a 7600, maybe a 7600 XT, maybe a 7700, I'm hoping a 7700. Um, so there'll be plenty of options available in the sort of sub $500 category, because right now, Everything is 500 plus that can do AV1, except for those cheap, adorable uh, Intel Arc cards, because a lot of those are available for below that price. But they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be powerful enough to like do all of your gaming at your highest level, as well as your encoding. Um, so they're, uh, you know, they're not, they're, they're not quite ready for someone who's using a single machine to game and stream. They're just not quite powerful enough. Um, but uh, yeah, so hopefully, come the end of Computex, good new, cheaper uh, entry level points for AV1 encoding, um, which means by the time if you're thinking about upgrading in a year or whatever, all of that stuff, the price will have lowered quite a bit, which would be great. Um, so that's cool. Also, it's Computex, so there'll be like lots of other cool stuff. I'm very excited for some new keyboards that are coming to Computex. Um, because there's, there's some there's some nice stuff in customizable hot swappable keyboards that I'm interested in and other bits and pieces. But uh, from an AV1 point of view, new graphics cards. Good. Yay. <laughs> Yay, and, uh, exactly. When I lean over like this, it's because my cat's down here begging for attention. Aww. And I have I have to, of course, pet. I don't make the rules. Um, you will. The, the chatty Irishman to cat ratio is all wrong <laughs> here. Yeah, right. <laughs> Your attention is not where it should be. <laughs> <laughs> But otherwise, Aww. cat makes a lot of noise, so you got to get the switches the cat is in. Like, the cat is like, I will mess up your recording. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Come here. Give me attention or I will mess up your recording. Guess you won't what? be able to clip this. <laughs> you got to be on stream now. Oh, there we go. So this is Hannah. Oh, look. She doesn't like this Found at all. Hannah. <laughs> she has to put up with it, so... <laughs> She she is doing her damnedest to get out of that. She's like, nope, I did not sign up for this. There's sometimes she's meowing at me and just wants me to pick her up and hold her for a few minutes. Aww. Oh, she's appearing in the corner. He's just oh yeah, no one at home. Can no see one at it. home like, can see it, but yeah. <laughs> oh, she's a dose. Yeah. So she comes down and interrupts me while I'm streaming now because I, I don't know. But she'll meow. And then Aww. she'll meow louder if I'm not petting her. And then she'll top of her lungs caterwaul. <laughs> <laughs> but but look at this now. You've got tech news, discussions, and a cat. Exactly. What more could you want <laughs> on a Friday evening? Exactly. How, how could you not want a, a kitty exactly. across your stream? Yes. I mean, Fantastic. isn't that what most of the internet is for? I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just think, AV1 encoding, higher quality oh, CAD videos, smaller <laughs> bandwidth. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Vampire survivors and cat videos. We're good. <laughs> that, that's all we really want to do is make better cat videos. Um, yeah, I mean, really, it's the, the entire YouTube platform is basically just, can we make better cat videos? Thank you. <laughs> 4K, four cats. All, all, all these big research think tanks and everything. It's just all about the cat videos. It's just all, just accept it. Roll with yeah. it. Life is easier. <laughs> <laughs> Us viewers are the real winners here. Exactly. Heck yeah. You see? <laughs> so 
So uh, back to CompuTex, oh, yeah. though. Uh, was hmm. there anything uh, going into keyboards a little bit? Were there anything specific about these keyboards or just their kind of... Um, just, it's, well, it's, been, it's been very interesting recently watching um, the... Because currently there are kind of like, there are there are sort of four keyboard, four distinct keyboard user groups that they kind of address usually when it comes to products. You've got the gaming gamer segment, which is mostly controlled by the same manufacturers that everybody knows, the, the Logitechs, you know, the, the, those people's um, who already do a bunch of other things. So, you know, you've got a Corsair keyboard and a Corsair mouse or a Logitech headset and a Corsair, you know, all this other stuff. Those folks, um, they've got gaming keyboards pretty much on lockdown. There's the sort of typing enthusiast keyboard section. Assume this is outside of this is consumer side rather than business side, because business side is like just give us give us ten thousand of those units. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, you've got the kind of consumer who is interested in the typing side, um, the people who have a have a distinct opinion between whether they like their keyboards thocky or creamy, that kind of those kind of folks. Um, and their side of the market has a lot of things like custom keycaps and custom switches and building your own boards and a whole bunch of other you know stuff. Um, up until now, there's been a small, tiny sliver in between, which is um, keyboards that are like those customizable ones, but good for gaming, because most of them don't have the lowest latency. So, but there are a few manufacturers who make keyboards that are more customizable and also suitable for gaming. Um, and over the last little while, like PAX was, was recently, um, we have seen the gaming companies start talking more about custom keycaps and hot swappable keyboards, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and also some of the custom keyboard companies talking more about gaming. So they both kind of realize that there's a segment in between them that they're now going to try and hit. Um, so like Ducky, for example, who make, you know, reasonably serviceable um, keyboards. Um, are going to come out with a wireless offering, which probably means something with software, which probably means you can control your RGB and all that jazz from software, which is kind of like what the gaming companies offer. And the gaming companies have been moving more towards hot swappable switches for gamers because they realize that a whole bunch of us will spend a bunch of extra money on customizing our keyboard if they let us. Um, so, so of course we will. Um, like Logitech, as I said before, Logitech already has a couple of hot swappable keyboards, but they don't hit some of the feature sets that the people on the keyboardy side like. As I keep saying, I'm a big fan of bottoms in all shapes and sizes, but I need a standardized bottom row. As in, all the keys on the bottom row of your keyboard have a standardized size, and that way everybody can use all of the different keycap sets and all the different things. Most companies have their own versions of the keyboard layout. So they're not compatible with each other. The, the custom keyboard people have a standardized set, which makes it compatible with lots of different things. But the gaming companies are moving in that direction. Meanwhile, the keyboard companies are moving towards gaming. And in the middle, we're going to get a whole bunch of really kind of niche keyboards that are good for gamers and come with a bunch of features we're used to, but also come with hot swappable uh, keycaps, south facing LEDs, standardized bottom rows, custom keycap sets, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And uh, yeah, I like I like keywords, so I'm like, ooh, this is this is exactly my wheelhouse. Um, I'm very excited for getting Excellent. myself maybe a new uh, a new Ducky Ten Keyless Wire or something like that, um, and getting myself a nice set of purple keycaps, and you know, just ooh. going full hard because my keyboards are always slabs of, you know, black and gunmetal gray gamer man keyboard. <laughs> um, so it's nice to be able to kind of move that along a little bit. That should be fun. Um, so there's a, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a group of people who will be at Computex. They've collectively got a booth. It's kind of, it's kind of adorable. <laughs> they're, they're all, all of the companies are too small to have their own, their own, um, <laughs> exhibitor area. So there's a, a bigger exhibitor area in the middle and there's like six of them all sharing. <laughs> they're, all, they're all relatively small companies. <laughs> so it's like head into the center. Yeah. You've got all these big people and then you've got this kind of group of people who all have little stands all set up in the middle. It's very adorable. Um, they'll be just around the corner from Leanne Lee. So if you are going to Computex, <laughs> you find yourself at Leanne Lee booth. Leanne Lee, makers of like some of the most lovely gaming cases ever um uh i have a new one hidden behind the green screen which people can't see but i've started building my new computer um, so I, have, I have 
so far only got the case <laughs> because there's there's a whole pile of logistical shenanigans going on. So I pre-ordered my case to arrive in like a month's time. And they were like, we managed to get a container load. Really? Yes. We managed to get a pallet that someone else didn't want. So now we have it. And it's on its way. You'll have it in like a week. And I'm like, okay, I have no other, no other components yet, but sure, I'll take it. <laughs> so I've got this, this giant box sitting on the bed behind me, just waiting to be filled with tech. Um, but yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be cool. Computex is great because it is, it is a trade information exhibition and the companies hold off on talking about stuff and hold off on releasing stuff until Computex happens. Um, and that's when it's good for us because we get, um, we get new products, which lowers the prices on existing products, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a little bit like CES, but in Taipei rather than, uh, Las Vegas or wherever CES is these days. I think it's Las Vegas. I think so. Hmm. And uh, pardon, thocky or creamy? Yes. Thocky or creamy? Yeah, the sound that your keyboard makes. <laughs> is it? Does it have thockiness, or is it creamy? And you're like, really? As opposed to what most of us have is cheap ABS plasticky. <laughs> <laughs> what does it sound like? I don't know. It, it sounds like plastic. So uh, look for Thocky and Creamy <laughs> coming up more, as well as uh, comparisons to things in Werther's original bags. Seriously, the only way I will ever describe how MP4 formats work now to people would be like, look, <laughs> let me tell you, the Werther's original bag, okay? <laughs> hey, it works. <laughs> we, we, we formed a new standard of descriptions, and uh, we yep. expect everyone to start using them for widespread yep. adoption. Yep. Sweets come in containers and wrappers. Videos come in containers and wrappers. We're good. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I, I actually, we need, to, we need to write that down as a way of explaining to everyone how fragmented files work. Complete with little <laughs> pictures of where there's original bags. It's like, and here's then, the ooh. metadata. That's like the ingredients, right? <laughs> and we could, you know, take an image of a Werther's originally and, you know, put a bunch of them together to represent the one. Or we could take a bunch and melt them together ourselves and take a picture yes. of that. Yes, a bag just of <laughs> melted worthers. This is what a normal MP4 looks like. It's not very good, is it? <laughs> like, how about we fragment them into individual suites for you? That better? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we, oh. we get to have candy and fire. I think we're winning. I mean, that sounds like a plan. Sugar yeah. and fire has never gone wrong. Nope. Never in the history of people. Nope. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. <laughs> so, yeah, get get to using those terms. Familiarize yourself. There'll be a little booklet later and, you know, it'll be like Timmy's first MP4 and things like that. And, you know. So there'll be a whole bunch of streamers who know way too much about what how an MP4 works because they've seen the word as original <laughs> graphic going around. <laughs> This is an excellent plan. Now I need to go buy a bag of Werther's Originals. Uh, oh, tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right. So another topic, which is going to be kind of shifting gears altogether, and something I mentioned last week, but I, I want to talk about again, is uh, VTTs or virtual tabletops. And uh, I kind of talked about this. If you go look at my lighting video, which was – Tech Friday last week, at, it's towards the end. But I talked about what a virtual tabletop would need to do to earn my seal of approval, basically. And we have all these VTTs coming out that have big fancy graphics and music is right there and everything. But everybody is in these little squares on the bottom and you get to see the map. And the map is huge, right? And takes up the area. Well, for streaming, that's only great for some things. For other things, I want to see the people. I want to be able to make a scene in these VTTs that is a, you know, still same graphic or a different graphic, whatever, but I can make the people's windows bigger. And then when we get into combat, when the map's needed, we can switch. Because otherwise, the people, everyone's just in these tiny little squares below. And you have this great big map that's not doing anything for a while. So, uh, yeah. So if you want to win my approval, you got to do that. You got to make it so 
I can make people more important and back on the screen because people are important and should be highlighted, uh, especially in this industry that we work in and the you know pay rates we're getting and things like that. People deserve to be highlighted more. Uh, and so that's what I would like to see. And that would instantly get, I am using this and recommending it hmm. because you allow me to highlight people. And sure, I can do that, a similar thing in OBS, but it's not going to look quite as good as having a smoother motion of the, those video frames moving up to a, uh, a an internal graphic. So yeah, that's the VTT rant. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, it's where things will go, though. Because yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, particularly in recent years, there is a there is a difference between playing a game online in a virtual tabletop environment and performing a game on stream. They have very different requirements, as you say. The the photographs of the people's faces that's where the performance is happening. The map is great and all, but like. The map isn't performing <laughs> the people's <laughs> right. faces are so i need to get those full screen and make the map small and then switch switcheroo when the time comes um you know I, I would rather never have a map and always have big people's faces if i had yep. to choose between the two the map could go away <laughs> yep or if i don't need a map but the neat thing about th these things is they have pretty graphics available and mm -hmm. uh the the music is you can use so at least most of them, you know, you'll have to look at that. So, yeah, also make sure your music's royalty-free. But, yeah, so you have these big fancy things. And, of course, they work as intended as, you know, just people playing. But if you want to see more streaming usage, I need to be able to make the people stand out. So, yay. VTGs, everybody. Yeah. Jeez. Ho I say, hopefully that's where they're moving. I mean, you would think it has to be because anyone who doesn't move that way, people just won't use you. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, your, your product's great for what it is, but if you want traction in production, got to do the thing. <laughs> so, you heard it here. Producer of the Star says, says, do the thing. Do the thing. <laughs> exactly. That's your that's your quote, DC Lazare, oh five oh five twenty three. Do the thing. Do the thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Any other thoughts on anything? Otherwise, we'll get into wrap up. And any questions, please ask. Now's the time. Oh yes. Any, anyone? Anyone? Questions is good. I don't know what quality of answers I have, but I probably have <laughs> thoughts on far too many things. I'm a beardy white guy on the internet. Unfortunately, of course, I have thoughts on far too many things. <laughs> so uh, anything else you want to cover about AV1 or... Oh, I, I had something. Don't confuse... Mm. Because of fonts and the way they work, don't confuse AV1 with AVI. Oh, I hadn't even thought of that. Yeah. <laughs> AVI is an old codec. You shouldn't be using it anymore. But... You know how some fonts are with that solid line that could be a one, a lowercase l, or an i, <laughs> right? It could be, or, or an uppercase God, i. I, I had, I, I had never made the connection. I was like, wow, yeah, because AVI is like thirty years old. Yeah, like it's you, you it's, should be it's using a very it. different thing. But if oh, you're typing AVI. it into the internet, you want AV1 oh. and make sure it's a number one. <laughs> Even if you type AV1, you, maybe something, maybe Google or whatever search engine you use this thinks you want AVI. You you do not. So oh. <laughs> Next up, Windows Media Video, WMV. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have you heard of Silverlight? Uh, <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> And suddenly we have dated ourselves very badly. <laughs> I, I'm like, no, I haven't. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, dear. But yes, AV1, good. AVI, less so. <laughs> less so, <laughs> exactly. So there's no reason to use AVI anymore. Uh, I mean... I'm sure someone somewhere will go, no, I have a use case. Fine, but don't bring it to me. Uh, <laughs> you want AV1 
and I have just a use case. Do you awesome. work at a computer museum? <laughs> <laughs> you're at a computer museum. I'm sure you've got to work. Maybe, maybe, maybe archiving or something. Sure. Cool. Okay. Sure, go cool. for it. Right. Everybody else. Nope. <laughs> Sorry, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> wow, coming for everyone right now. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna we're gonna start talking about Flash. We're gonna start talking about building web pages in Notepad. We're gonna talk about <laughs> back when when Photoshop was a thing you bought and then just had. We're gonna go right back. <laughs> Pardon me while I load my my data off this cassette tape that I have. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> back when floppy disks were actually floppy. Wait, just keep it on. <laughs> Oh, Great, go time. use that case over that mountain <laughs> far away from me. <laughs> exactly, yep. exactly. Take your use case and go over there with it. It's fine. <laughs> you do you, boo, and all that. But like, yeah. Oh, I remember oh, Flash. I hadn't, Ooh, even, I hadn't even thought about it. Animating yeah. Flash. There, there's a use case of AV1 that I hadn't even thought about. And yeah. it's, um, it's um, I, don't, I should, probably shouldn't say on your show because we don't condone in any way, shape, or form. But, but being able to share video files in much smaller file sizes may be useful in many, many ways other than just as a streamer. Um, yeah, that's a thought. There's probably going to be a bunch of people converting old stuff into AV1, taking it and re-encoding it. And uh, Handbrake mm. is a video yeah. transcorder, and they have AV1 support. I would say, yeah. So just, exactly, I, 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 I hadn't even thought of that. Like. Oh, aside from like I say, aside from piracy and the spicier parts of the internet, um, because I imagine spicy internet providers are going to love this too, because they're almost always at the forefront front of streaming video exactly. delivery. Exactly, amazing that. Um, <laughs> oddly enough, none of the usual spicy internet big names are advertised as being part of the uh, alliance of open media, but I'm sure they're there. <laughs> um, but uh, but also like stuff like stuff like archiving stuff. So imagine you've got a whole bunch of stuff in like either a not if not in a lossless format, but in a, in a large file size, and you want to just run it through a batch process and get it all converted to AV1, and then suddenly you've got a whole bunch of the same quality video, but in a smaller file size than before. Mm -hmm. It'll actually be great for just people who are archiving all their stuff. I imagine I wonder if like people who do like a bunch of YouTube sh shows and stuff will take all of their stuff and just encode it down into AV1 because I mean if you're someone who runs a YouTube channel and you do all of your stuff in 4K how many how many hard drives does it take to store all your old stuff I'm sure you'll keep probably keep the raw stuff I imagine lots of people still keep the raw stuff but mm -hmm. you also probably almost certainly have various stages of the edit plus the final product as an MP4 probably um, whereas now you could take that MP4 and turn it into an AV1 version of itself that is you know, 30% smaller maybe or something. That'd be huge over, over hundreds of videos. That'd be great. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, Rex, collection of home movies, non-spicy. Or, you know, spicy well, ones, yeah. depending on... Spicy, what you do. Yeah. yeah. I did, uh, part of my years as a video tech was uh, putting stuff to DVD, like copying old 8mm, 16mm film nice. to DVD. And so, again, we had to make sure that what we were doing didn't run afoul of the MPEG-2 LA stuff just be, so I people know. could preserve their memories. Yeah, I actually remember, remember um, a place that did that and they they got stuff by projecting it onto a wall and recording it. And that was basically how they converted it down and then added music to yeah. it. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, but even like, even like, I mean, I have, I have a, I have a Blu-ray collection. I have a DVD collection as well, but I have like a Blu-ray, I have about, probably 300 Blu-ray movies. Like I have, a, I have a, a sizable amount of Blu-rays, but I almost never plug an optical drive into my machine. So for things that I watch more often, maybe rumor may have it that I have a local copy that I have because I'm not getting the discs out, plugging in a drive to put a disc in to watch an episode of something. I own the content, I have the physical discs, I have the license attached to those physical discs. Yes, I'm still falling afoul by having a personal copy, but like saving hard drive space, maybe I will take, because I, I mean, it's, it's usually like it's, it's old TV shows. It's, it's stuff that just isn't available on a streaming service here and I physically own on Blu-ray. Mm -hmm. um, but I could, I could pop a few of my, my, my you know, the, the ones you always return to when you, there's nothing on you don't want to watch. I could pop a few of those in and 
drop them into AV1 and have just more hard drive space for like basically no loss. Heck, yeah. even if just backing up stuff, you want to back up all your old all your old home movies to a, a an external drive, pop them into AV1, stick them on an external drive. There you go. You've got a spare backup. It's always there in case anything goes wrong. Yep. And uh, oh. I, I mentioned a thing called Handbrake. And Handbrake is completely free. It's open source. Uh, and what you do is you take video file X and you say, okay, Handbrake, turn this into video file Y. And it will just go depending on the speed of your machine and all these things. It, you know, it depends on how long that takes. Like we said, it can do AV1, but on current stuff, that's going to be slower than H.264, but you can do it. So if you're not planning on using your machine for a few hours, say overnight while you're asleep, pump some video in there, hit the go button and let it go. We're, we, we have robbed entire generation of having to do FFmpeg using a command line interface. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Handbrake has been around a very long time. Yeah, so yeah, it it's been a yeah. long time since anyone's really, I mean, I suppose you're doing batch processing. You probably might still do it as a, like mm -hmm. just just run it from a command prompt because you're you're just you don't need the interface you just need to process a whole pile of files in one go, but uh, yeah, Handbrake is is super handy. Um, I mean, it's and so easy to use. As I think I think Handbrake was actually how I how I got most of the stuff that I wanted to keep off disk, even though the disks are literally on a shelf right there. Um, but yeah, we don't we don't we don't tend to put physical drives in our computers anymore. So, you know, maybe you do want to keep some home movies on a on a on a drive. Um, yeah, that's actually, I, I, I haven't thought about the archiving space that you could save because I imagine there's a whole pile of places that are keeping a bunch of stuff and it's expensive mm -hmm. to hold. Whereas if everybody accepts AV1, although usually for archiving, you want to have a, a format that's very old and very well supported because you don't want to be able to, you don't want to suddenly find that you can't read a thing. It's a huge problem with a whole bunch of stuff. Like it's like the way you've got a whole pile of stuff now where oh, from a video game point of view, um, modern operating systems just don't support a whole pile of stuff. So you go to try and play a video game from 20 years ago and you discover that the, the, the movies inside the video game don't work. And it's because nobody has supported that codex in 16 years. And you're like, oh, okay, well, how do I, well, somebody somewhere has to go and convert it to something that your machine can work with. Um, but like, I imagine that from a, from a point of view of just being able to provide stuff, online like online content delivery from an educational point of view as well like being able to get a huge amount of video le lectures and stuff in smaller file sizes that can be accessible in places in the world maybe where your internet connection is not great um you know in parts of the country where your internet connection is not great uh there's, there's a whole pile of cool stuff with that i miss playing warcraft 2 my friends oh memories yeah i was looking at a very very good condition not quite mint boxed big box copy of warcraft 2 the other day and i was humming and hawing over whether i suddenly found myself with exceptional spare money <laughs> to spend <laughs> yeah oh. it wouldn't run on my machine of course it would purely be to have the nice box and then to get a version that works <laughs> oh yeah sorry I mean, random random video game tangent if your cd-rom drive isn't 32x i don't know what you're doing anymore. yeah do you, do you or do you yeah. not have a sound blaster in there yeah <laughs> um, although i saw a really cool thing recently actually because of how good we've gotten now particularly with multi-core processors i saw a, a video on i'm pretty sure it was linus tech tips um with a, a pc emulating a windows 95 machine not a virtual machine partitioned off. No, actually just emulating the entire machine. Oh, wow. <laughs> and it was running really, really well. Um, yeah, there, there's a, there's a, there's a, the project was started by somebody, but she left that project to go on to something else, um, but it's still going. But basically you could, you could emulate a Windows 95 machine on modern hardware, including getting to decide which sound blaster card you have plugged in and <laughs> did you were you one of those cuckoos who bought a phys x card or a voodoo too which of those do you have <laughs> and it was emulating the entire thing was being emulated in software it was it was very cool so that might be the future of things like dos box is forget dos box you've got 95 box and you just <laughs> emulate um because I, I i was recently playing a, a thief 2 one of my favorite games ever thief 2 the metal age um Again, 
I was browsing eBay for nice looking boxed copies. Um, but it has to be entirely rebuilt to run on modern hardware. The video codecs don't work. The audio is broken really badly. So you rely on people doing a lot of work to get it still working. Um, whereas now just emulate an entire Windows 95 machine and run it on that. <laughs> Perfect. Complete with like, complete with like bleepy bloopy sound effects and all that. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. It fully emulates a sound blaster card. It's like, Perfect. I wonder <laughs> if it emulates the PC speaker itself. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> oh, we go from AV1, <laughs> the future of 16K video streaming, you know, 16K, 120 mm. frames per second. Also, emulate a Windows 95 machine to play my. <laughs> and mean, Warcraft 1, Orcs and Humans. Yeah. You, you can. Uh, I think it was uh, Minecraft. Someone built a Windows 95 emulator in as well. Nice. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen, I've seen, I've seen, I saw someone build a, a Commodore 64 uh, SID chip inside Minecraft, and I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> it, it is, it is cool, it is cool having seen the tech progress to the point where the latest, coolest, newest tech is being used to make like fun puppet versions of the old tech. <laughs> right. It's like I love this. And and this yeah. is why we like sites like Good Old Games, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> because Absolutely. they do a lot of this work. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, the amount of people who work on, particularly the stuff that goes on GOG and um, and DOSBox has been a big, been a big win. But like, mm -hmm. there's so much stuff where you rely on somebody in the community literally taking a video game and breaking it back down into its component pieces to pull out the bits that are broken, and work out a way of getting them working again and put them all back in just so that someone can come along in you know 2023 and fire up an old game and it just works like there's so many games that were on steam and they're just they're just broken now mm -hmm. um but they just they just don't function correctly um it's like yeah if you're going to download this from steam yeah you download it from steam yeah and then you also download this program which patches the audio and then you download this program which fixes the video and then if you want you can download this hd texture mod but like even the game on Steam doesn't really work anymore. And there's a whole pile of games just like that that just don't function as well. So uh, I can imagine that, yeah, there's probably like a lot of stuff that could get turned into AV1s now to run in smaller sizes and smaller packets. That'd be great. Mm. Yeah. And uh, just oh, to touch dear. on the video game thing, if you haven't gone to archive.org before, it's an amazing resource. And they have a bunch of... Uh, older video games that, you know, would be in arcade cabinets and things like that, that aren't available anywhere else. And they are all in DOS box emulation and you just run them in your browser. And constantly under legal threat, unfortunately, because yeah. greed, greed has no expiration date. Um, it's literally stuff that companies aren't selling. There's even stuff that they don't know who the owners are anymore because things have changed hands so many times and things have gone from company to company to company. It's, I was going to say, it's, it's, it's like how it used to be with books. No, it's like how it currently still is with books in different <laughs> regions. Um, you ever tried to figure out who actually owns an out-of-print book? It can be real complicated real fast. But they've got, they've got old video games there that, let's say, literally are not available. You can't buy them. No one is going to make any money off them. But don't you worry. There's a bunch of lawyers trying to make sure that someone can't play, you know, I, 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 I don't know, you know, you know, neighborhood paperboy delivery three from MAME in 1978. It's, it's just, yeah, it's really bad. But it's a wonderful website. I say great for a whole bunch of old stuff, particularly anything that can be emulated. It's it's really cool. Um, I say it's, you know, constantly under threat. It and the Internet Archive constantly under threat <laughs> for the, the other side of the Internet. We're going to put all the books up here. Oh, you can't do that. <laughs> We're going to put all these movies up here. Oh, you really can't do that. <laughs> See, like but when yeah, an author it, it, isn't allowed to write or publish about a series or world anymore because the publishers claim it. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Or or when you get, um, in particular, in one case, um, uh, I can't remember who it was. Shoot. There is an author I follow on Twitter whose name is currently escaping me. They can't write stuff in their first book series, in the world in their first book series, because... It was published in one region by one publisher, published in another region by a different publisher. That other publisher sub-published it to a separate publishing house in a third region. 
that publishing house went into liquidation and things got weirdly legal. So the licensing for that book series in one country is currently in a weird limbo of nobody knows who owns it. So until such time as they work that out, they don't want to touch it because somebody somewhere might be not making one penny on that book. <laughs> it's, 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 a really, it's a really weird, I can't remember who it was, it's a really weird story, but basically, yeah, things can fall into licensing black holes and you end up, I mean, heck, it was a great video game example. Anyone who's ever played Alan Wake? Alan Wake has a wonderful soundtrack. Alan Wake had to be taken off Steam for a while because the record companies that owned all the different individual songs and all the different bands were moving around and changing hands and things were changing ownership so fast that people couldn't keep track of it all. And some of it fell out of licensing or the agreement wording changed. And suddenly that video game from X amount of years ago you weren't allowed to play that because there's music in there that might maybe possibly belong to some different rich person now. And the whole thing had to get shut down, which is, again, one of the reasons why you want places that keep archives of things. Because if you had downloaded the game, you could still play it, but you couldn't go and buy Alan Wake for a while. You couldn't go and buy it because they couldn't sell it to you until they had figured out who does own that second last song on the album in the Europe region. Nobody knows. <laughs> and until we figure this out, nobody can buy the game anywhere. It's a, it's a mess. And that's why we don't want, uh, that's why we want, again, that's why we want AV1. That's why we don't mm -hmm. want 1,600 patents and 500 lawyers. We just like a standard that allows us to do nice video. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Yeah. And that's where, it, you know, it, yes, it involves big companies. It involves Amazon, Microsoft, and all that. But it takes those companies to get through all the legal hurdles. Because yep. we we just don't know sometimes who owns those video patents, and they have to they went through the process and the monies to track all that down, mm -hmm. and that's only something a large uh, because of the way system is set up, particularly in the U.S. That's only something large conglomerates such as that could afford to do. Yeah, which is you know, <laughs> depending how you feel about things is either good or bad. It's, However, we're getting AV1 out of it. Yeah, it's in their interest because they're making money. Oh, they're mm -hmm. saving more, more. They're saving money, which means they're making money. But yeah, it's in their interest to do it this way because they're saving money. But yeah, you want to kill a piece of technology, make it so that small to medium sized people and organizations don't feel safe using it. <laughs> like you want to kill a piece of tech. I mean, that's, I mean, kind of what happened with H265. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like, Nobody wanted to step into the minefield of working out whether or not they were suddenly going to find themselves in violation of a license agreement with patent holder number 365 in a list of people. Now, do you have a team of lawyers? No. Great. AV1. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's, so, there's so much stuff that works that way. You, you're, you're amazed some technology ever got off the ground because of how complicated. I mean, Patent law and licensing law is super complicated and super messy. Um, and as a small person, you just can't deal with that. You just, you just can't. Yeah. And uh, going back to AV1, that, that is one thing uh, the articles on it I was reading bring up is that, yeah, for archiving, people didn't want to touch H.264, even though it would have been handy and convenient, uh, they might have had to pay for their usage of it. And just didn't have the money and AV1 yeah. will solve a lot of those issues. And, you know, we, we preserve the works that would otherwise be lost. Yeah. Can you, can you, I mean, can you imagine a museum or uh, an educational institution or something getting hit for a bill for however many licenses <laughs> for H264 for their entire catalog of stuff? And you're like, yeah, you know, yeah. nobody could, nobody could handle that. Um, so yeah, definitely, uh, definitely a win. Oddly enough, because it's a win for the big guys, it happens to also be a win for us. Um, so, and there's not many of those. So, <laughs> no, I mean, is is Flack is Flack open source? Uh, I think so. Like, there there are other open source codecs, or there have been, but they're not mm -hmm. as good as H.264. Uh, you know, like. Yeah, what, what was FLAC, the F in FLAC stands for free, if I remember free, that is yeah. right. Yeah, so yeah. Um, 
because yeah, there you go. Case in point, imagine if there was an audio equivalent problem that we currently have. Imagine if every MP3 being passed around on the internet had to pay an additional license fee to somebody somewhere and there's extra money somewhere. And if you wanted to provide MP3s, you had to pay a license fee to somebody else. And if someone wanted to listen to them, they had to pay a license fee to somebody else and around and around and around it goes. And suddenly, you know, a whole pile of places that would deliver audio books, for example, can't do it. Why? Well, because they'd have to pay every single time they gave you an audio book, they'd have to pay a license fee. And every time you download it, you'd pay a license fee. Yeah. Get rid of a, a couple of middlemen in the middle and everyone can just get on with actually doing cool stuff. Um, so, yes. Yeah. Uh, AV1, my uh, my check. When do I get my, <laughs> <laughs> when do I, when do I get my check? Oh, open media uh, group. Send money yeah. to that guy. Send money to me. Yep, send me some money for... Uh... <laughs> no, no, no shilling necessary. It's, it's, it's great tech. It's great tech and it's long overdue. So as soon as we can get our hands on it, I, I'm, I mean, I'm looking forward to it. There's a whole pile of people who stream at lower resolutions and lower frame rates than they'd like because mm -hmm. they don't have money for big expensive computers and their internet isn't great. It's going to be awesome to be able to say, no, you'll be fine. You'll be able to stream it, you know, in smaller sizes and... Because you can you can upgrade your graphics card, you can't tell your internet service provider to not be rubbish. Particularly yep. <laughs> in certain countries where every state is basically a monopoly for a particular provider, and they've divided the whole country up. You get the internet service, you get. So if we can get you better streams for the same internet, win. Yeah, and um, more people can watch your content at you know better frame rates and. Well, yeah, the transcoding thing will be less of a less of a concern. Um, you know, you you won't have to sort of if you don't have transcoding that day because of a busy server day, and people are trying to watch your stream in source 1080p60, and they just can't, and they can't enjoy your stream, so they can't, you know, they can't hang out and watch. Now, they'll get 1080p60 and half the files. Well, not half size, sort of 60 to 70 percent of the file size. That'll work for a lot of people. Oh yeah. Speaking of uh, screen screen size, uh, is transcoding similar to the bitrate thing? <clears throat> you, <Me too. laughs> you you can go. You you might know a little sure. more about this than that. Um, yes, sort of. If you've ever been watching a video, particularly partnered streamers on Twitch, but it's available for pretty much everybody these days. Um, YouTube has been a standard for so long. Um, when I send a video to Twitch, I send a video at 1080p 60 at 6,000 uh, kilobits per second. Then what Twitch does is they take that video and as it is streaming live, they convert it into a 1080p 60 version, a 720p version, a 640 version. And I think, that just do they go as low as 320 these days still? They might do. Yeah. They basically, they make, they make copies of it at lower resolutions and smaller sizes. So that if your internet connection isn't good enough to watch at what is the native standard resolution, you can watch it at 720. Is that good? If you're on your phone, for example, you don't need to watch YouTube videos at 1080p. You, you can't tell the, on your phone, you can't see that. Watch yeah. them at 720, save yourself the internet bill. Um, so yeah, transcoding basically, and it's transcoding is rather server intensive because they've got to take a video literally in the seconds it is being fed to the audience and convert it into multiple versions of itself. That's why originally partners were the only ones who could get it because it was, mm -hmm. it's rather processor intensive because every single stream coming in, having to get copied into smaller and smaller versions of itself. Um, these days, transcoding is way more common. Uh, yeah, you'll see setting in the cogwheel. Yep. Yeah, exactly. The setting in the cogwheel, that one there. Yeah. Um, you'll see it these days on, on most folks' streams. It's because they've got the server infrastructure and it's come a long way. Um, currently, for example, one thing that YouTube do is saying earlier, um, if you upload a video in AV1 to YouTube, they will automatically transcode it into VP9 so that everyone can watch it because most folks can't watch AV1 yet. Um, so yeah, it's basically just converting it into a slightly different file size or a slightly different format for the viewer, um, which is what, what you do with, uh, with a Twitch video when you make it a smaller version of itself so that someone else can watch it. With AV1, you maybe will never need to watch a video in 720 again because the 1080p version will be as small as the 720 version used to be. Mm -hmm. Happy days. And so, yeah. So like for YouTube, they're not only hosting the version you put up there, they're hosting 
all the other versions they need to transcode into. So depending on your internet, you can scale it. So they're hosting five different versions or how many ever they have different versions of your video. Yep. And if you're live streaming, they are making that conversion in real time as you're live streaming. <laughs> like I said, the, the latency between me and Twitch is like less than seven seconds. So when I say something, it appears on my stream, usually like sort of six seconds later. In that six seconds, they are taking my stream, delivering it to you, converting it into five smaller versions of itself, the whole thing all happening at the same time. And I'm like a teeny tiny streamer with like, you know, 30 viewers kind of thing. And they're doing that for everybody. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a big deal. And that's partly why they don't want to do that with H.264. <laughs> they want to do that with someone that takes a lot less time and a lot less space and save a bunch of money. And so, yeah. And like when I started streaming a couple of years ago, uh, you couldn't change the, um, it, you couldn't transcode your video source into a different one. It was whatever you pumped out. And so it's a recent thing that uh, affiliates and I don't know if non-affiliates get this, but you can actually watch my stream now. You know, I go out at 1080p 60 now because you can change it to 720p 60, 480p 360. You can, you have a variety. 160. Wow. Yeah. 160p. <laughs> I was like one pixel. Just one chatty pixel. One in the pixel. Corner. One, one little bit of the hat. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so yeah, I think it's I think it's definitely uh, almost all of I've I've been in affiliate streams with like I've been in streams of affiliates with like six viewers and they've had access to transcoding. So I think they tend to prioritize the larger stuff because like cost cost to viewer delivery, mm -hmm. I'm sure. Um, but like, yeah, I've been in tiny, tiny, tiny streams and they've had transcoding options. So it seems to be like if there's space, is there a League of Legends tournament going on at the moment? No? Okay, then there's probably server space. <laughs> you can usually tell when transcoding is gone, I'm like, what's running tonight? Oh, it's a Counter-Strike tournament. That's probably what it is then. <laughs> yeah, if, if there's a big gaming tournament on, almost always when League is on, if there's a big gaming tournament on, I think that takes over a little bit and some folks will suddenly find they don't have access to transcoding. But like these days, it's it's so common, it's great. Because um, it means anyone can watch me from anywhere, pretty much with a really bad internet connection. You can just turn the quality down, and the audio is still fine. Mm -hmm. You know, I might become blurry or you know less less detailed, but the audio is still fine. Um, so you can still like you know mostly get the same experience. Um, yeah, like like we said earlier, like, like we said earlier, audio is a, a fraction of video in in terms of yeah. size and for a huge amount of quality. Um, uh, the audio. I mean, what's, 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 what's an album? 320 kilobits per second? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, most people were listening to back in, again, back in the days of possibly doing things on the internet that, you know, various companies wouldn't like, um, were listening to MP3s of their favorite songs in like a fraction of that, like, and it was still perfectly, perfectly fine, you know? So, yeah. Let's see. Small Lequeal uses 160p if I'm just listening. Fascinating. Yeah, um, there you go. Why, yeah. why waste the internet bandwidth? Yeah. If, you're, if you're like, if you're on mobile as well, like, you don't need to save, save battery power, and, reduce uh, heat. For 160p for all my pong streams, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> there's just these, there's these two pixels, and they're talking to each other. <laughs> <laughs> Those intense pong tournaments, tournaments yeah. you want. 160p is your champion. Could you imagine? <laughs> case in point, though. Case in point. Pong co encoded with H.264, really big file size. Encoded with AV1, extremely small file size because <laughs> entire parts of the screen don't change at all and are only one color. Perfect. Great example. <laughs> Great example. Yeah, you only need to predict the motion of the two white boxes that are moving mm -hmm. and the rest of the screen is almost entirely static all the time. That will be tiny file sizes. It'll be <laughs> wonderful. H.264, every 16 by 16 pixels, they have to go, is it still black square? Yeah, it's a black square. Is it a black square? Yeah, it's a black square. Is it a black square? Yeah, it's a black square. With AB1, 128 by 128, which means, you know, I say, do, do the math, many, many times more. <laughs> nice. 
Hell yeah, uh, 60 frames per second. I want to see the smoothest pong boop. <laughs> <Yeah>. Exactly. <laughs> Watch, watching, a, watching a pong tournament on like original hardware, which has a refresh rate of like eight frames a second. Oh, and wow. You're watching it in 60. <laughs> <laughs> you can actually see the blur line <laughs> as it follows it because you're getting the actual individual frames multiplied like three or four times. You're getting a little slightly light gray box behind the white box. <laughs> you get to see the ghosting in its real mm -hmm. shape. Because, of course, back on a CRT, it was a nice, satisfying blur, but on a square pixel screen, it's a square. <laughs> oh, good times. Good times. Yeah. <laughs> Thinking ah. back to my Atari 2600 playing Pong. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I, I was never lucky enough to have have a, have an Atari. I had a I had a C64. That was my Ooh. that was my entry point. I I I made a red ball bounce up and down on a blue background. It only took me like ten thousand lines of basic, but we did it. <laughs> <laughs> ah, good times. Ah, uh, basic. <laughs> yeah, uh, everyone's everyone's you know everyone's print. Hello world. world. Go to ten. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> ah, a rite of passage. We don't really do so much anymore. <laughs> Oh, and they the have Tetris. Nintendo Online thingy, I can now play OG GB games. Yes, and they have yeah. Tetris, yes. You never forget yeah, your first go-to. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Heck yeah, you never forget your first go-to. Yeah, they, they, they do some wonderful uh, Nintendo emulation these days. It's actually quite impressive. Um, some of the newer stuff, the emulators don't work as well as we'd like. Um, there are better alternative options. Um, but yeah, it's it's great being able to just, to just pick up a really old, like pick up you know an old Pokemon game that you played on Game Boy when you were younger and play exactly that same thing again, like on your laptop or on your iPad or whatever, or on your Switch. You know, it's great being able to just do that now. Um, oh, good times. So a uh, brief bit of Tetris history because uh, in video mm. games, because I know this and we'll wrap up quick soon here. We're already over time. <laughs> Sorry, DC. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. It's Sorry. Great. Uh, so being the first, talking about being the first video game, uh, there was a company before Nintendo really cracked down on it when the NES was first available. There were third-party companies making cartridges that didn't have Nintendo approval, but they could make them. There was a company called Tengen, and they made a version of Tetris. And I think that might have been the first one, but and that had really great music, but it couldn't be sold anymore once Nintendo goes, nope, we have the seal of approval program, you do this, otherwise you're out of here and we're cracking down. And then I think the Game Boy Tetris that everyone knows and loves came out. And then eventually there was a Nintendo-made version of Tetris. I wonder, I would say, I would say, I wonder if Tangen's version is floating around on various archives. <laughs> I don't know, but the, the music for it was great. So mm. <laughs> I, I, I preferred that to all the other <laughs> The little eight bit tune that came out of it. I, I would love to be able to find that again and just listen. To Hi, I, I I was looking. I was looking on. Um, I was looking on. Um, on online recently for um, music from some Commodore sixty four games that were released. Um, and I have not been able to locate them, but I did find a couple of old Commodore sixty four games that I really really liked, and they're now playable in a web browser. One of them is literally hosted on the official website of the newer version of the game. They're like, do you want to play the version from 982? And I'm like, heck yes, I do. <laughs> awesome. It's just available in a browser. <laughs> All the sound effects, everything else is exactly as I remember it. And I'm able to just pick it up and play it. Um, so yeah, I'm sure someone out there has gone, this was the better Tetris music. I should stick this up on the <laughs> internet somewhere. <laughs> Pro actually, I found some stuff hilariously in YouTube videos. I suspect a whole pile of it, the... Um, the kind of copyright uh, algorithms that go sniffing through the content are like, I don't know what these beeps and groups are. I don't know. Sounds good though. And they move on to something else. Yep. <laughs> they're, not, they're not, they're not too bothered about co copyright striking someone playing, you know, Tengen Tetris music from <laughs> whatever, whatever year. <laughs> you know, 1980s. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and it, we're, we're still very young. We're still very young. Um, so we would, we wouldn't know 1980. What? We wouldn't know what that is. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. No. We're both 90s babies, of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Yeah. All right. <sighs> so I think we've tangents. exhausted ourselves Wild and tangents. tangents. <laughs> <laughs> this has been great. I, lo I love I love this. All right. Uh, so tomorrow, Saturday, is Free Comic Book Day. So uh, go to freecomicbookday.com, type in a city or wherever around the world, and uh, see if there's free comic books you can get. Also, when you go to that comic shop, buy something from them as well because support local businesses. But mm -hmm. do all that after you watch Steven's stream tomorrow. Oh, that's that's true. I do have a stream tomorrow. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> what you doing? Um, tomorrow is, uh, it's going to probably be Coral Island. So just, you know, cozy farming vibes tomorrow. Um, Sunday is, I'm, we're switching the day that myself and Sue, myself and Sue always play together one day a week. Um, we're switching that to Sundays now because Saturday kind of, it bumps up against our D and D game. So we're kind of switching ring. Um, so we're doing raft on Sunday. So we have Sunday rafternoons. Um, but tomorrow is Saturday. So that'll be Coral Island. So just kind of cozy farming stuff's rock on up with your graphics card questions <laughs> and AV1 <laughs> questions, <laughs> feel free. <sighs> while we're cleaning, while Steven's cleaning the bottom of the seafloor. Yep. He can, he can, he can tell you he can. more about <laughs> video compression and stuffs. <laughs> and stuff. <sighs> he'll, he'll rant about why NVIDIA are greedy. That's what he'll do. Yeah. Invariably. <laughs> And uh, I will be back on Monday at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. I will be playing more Dredge. That will probably be the game until I either beat it or Breath of the uh, Tears of the Kingdom comes out. Breath of the Wild, mm. Tears of the Kingdom comes out. And then this stream is just Tears of the... There will still be a Tech Friday. Don't worry. I'll, I'll begrudgingly give up the time to do a Tech Friday. <clears throat> but I... I it's all going to be Tears of the Kingdom. It's just... What are the chances the tech fight is going to be? Let's discuss the tech used in Tears of the Kingdom. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> We're like, well, if you use the Fuse thing or the Ultra Glove to make this. <laughs> An entire thing about fusing, you know, stick with house to yeah. make a really big hammer. <laughs> okay. That is going to be wild. That's going to be, I saw <clears throat> some, some sample ideas mm -hmm. and it's going to be wild. <laughs> Look, I, I want to combine a fish with a boomerang and live my best New Zealand life. Perfect. And I, <laughs> that's really what, what I'm hoping I can do. I want fish boomerangs. I do wonder if they wanted to make up, because some people, some people were a little unhappy with the fact that the weapons in Breath of the Wild are made of slightly soggy cardboard a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. you, burn, you burn through a lot of weapons. The durability isn't great. But like, what if I just stuck a handle in a rock? <laughs> yeah, that'll work. Cool. Oh, okay. Cool. Boulder weapon. Cool. <laughs> Great. I'm going to stick a handle in this rock. There we go. Boom. Like, there's your durability problem solved. Just make sure you fuse it with a boulder every time. Okay, cool. <laughs> you know, I got a big fish and a boomerang. I fuse them together. There we go. Done. <laughs> Yeah, it's, I, it's, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be fun. I do want to check out Dredge as well, though, because Dredge looks like a lot of fun. Yeah, um, great. I have not gotten around to it yet, sadly. Dredge is an appropriate level of spooky where it's not, like, mm. overly horror, but there's just enough under under the surface things where you're going, why, why am I doing this? Why are you casting a spell on me? Why can't I stop you casting <laughs> a spell on me? Well, I guess you cast a spell on me. Uh <laughs> Sometimes that's just how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it looks it looks it looks cool. I haven't I haven't checked out any streams yet because I've been trying to save myself from spoilers, but I've I've waited so long now to get into it. Like at this stage, I'm just like, I either have to jump or just start watching people stream it because like I can't wait too long. <laughs> uh bolder you to assume Link is on our excellent pun. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, uh other things I'm doing because I have a bunch mm. of stuff to promote. Um uh, I make Notion templates. Please check them out if you do any TTRPG stuff. And, uh, oops, it's templates, if I can remember my own commands. So, there you go. The first link, if you want a DM screen, a player's journal, or various ways to keep track of information on of your TTRPG or your actual play show, go to that first link there. Second link, if you want to keep track of your production from pre to post, use that template. That will guide you through every little bit. I made a poll uh, 
about a month ago, and it came out uh, of what to name it. And the Lacer method, it was the approved thing. So if you use that, just call it the Lacer method, and uh, you'll be all set. And there's checklists. And if anything's confusing, I've added instructions to there. I even have uh, links to my YouTube videos explaining the things. And if you still have questions, feel free to reach out to me and ask. And speaking of my YouTube, I have one of those. Go there where you can see all the Tech Friday videos now available in a handy dandy playlist. And all the other things I do, uh, all the talks I have will go up there and the random video game clips will be there. So yeah, check out my YouTube and for absolutely everything I do, go to dclacer.bio.link and find all the things. Yeah, and uh, I'm producer for Rivals of Waterdeep. There isn't a Rivals of Waterdeep this week. There will be one the following week. So check that out. It's wrapping up soon, and uh, I'm feeling a way about that. But yeah, it's a really good show. Check it out. It's available where all of your good podcasts are available because it's a good podcast too, so it's there. And uh, let's see here. There will be more stuff in the future. I will have an actual play probably coming out in the fall. So please Ooh. check that out. And uh, details for that will be on my Twitter. And yeah, I think I think that covers everything I'm doing currently. Um, I wear a lot of hats. Probably not as many tiny hats as Steven, but uh, bigger. They're, they're bigger. <laughs> <laughs> There's some hats involved. <laughs> All right. Once again, go follow Stephen. It's Stephen Enjoys everywhere. Or Stephen Joys. Sorry. Either way. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> Stephen Joys. <laughs> yep. That's me. Check him out. Great content all the time. And thank you all for being here. It's been great. I, I really love having people on, being able to talk about them and just having this passion about tech. It's it's wonderful. Nobody in my IRL life wants to know about AV1. So this has been very good for me <laughs> because it gets to get from in here to out, out there. there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so no one else wants to hear about it. None of my colleagues at work care about AV1. I get to tell somebody. <laughs> it's like going around having this cool secret, but no one knows who you want. <laughs> I get to tell people. It's great. Tell people. So thank yeah. you very much for allowing me to tell people about the wonders <laughs> of AV1. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh. I'm going to quickly see on who's available to raid, uh, unless you have someone, Stephen. Uh, um, gosh, off the top of my head, otherwise... I don't know if um, if Brian's thing has gone live yet. Oh, yeah. Um, I had a thing today. It, uh, yeah. Um, uh, watch Party. Um Oh yeah, watch party. It's on is... time. Watch party thing for Citadel. I think it's supposed to go live at ten my time, so it might actually be I think going live shortly. Live. Yeah. A... Oh, yep. It says he's there. He's got two people in. So, uh, so Herb, he's on. Perfect. So Herb is doing a watch party of new spy show that I've just blanked the name on. Citadel. Citadel. Yeah. So if you have Amazon Prime, you can watch along. And we'll go over there to say hi. So stay tuned for that. Thank you all so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you once again, Stephen, for being here. Thank you for putting up with me. Excellent. I mean, having me. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll talk to you all later. Go watch Stephen's stream tomorrow. Bye. Aww.